Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sean. Thank you so much for coming here this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can please turn to Galatians chapter 2. Now, usually I send out the lesson via email to the members of the church, just so it's a little bit easier to follow along, as well as you can go back, double check what I preach, go double check what I say, and build your own convictions on the Word of God. So if you need that handed to you, you can just nudge the person to your left or to your right. They may or may not have it, and they can just forward that on to you in your email. But if not, and you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 2. As a church, we're going to be going through the book of Galatians through the next couple of weeks. Uh, we went through uh, last week, just chapter 1, talking about how... You know, that the, what the word works means in the, in the church right there, fighting for the truth. And we're going to kind of continue on that trend as well, mm. coming up to chapter 2. Come on. You know, looking out in the world right now, especially in the news and everything that's going on, you start to realize, man, there's a lot of things going on in the world today. Mm. Well, to be honest, there's probably always a lot of things going on in the world. Yeah. I think probably maybe previous generations just didn't know about it. Ooh. You know, maybe it took a little bit longer for the newspaper to get out or something. But now we have it a little bit more highlighted in our face, right? Yeah. Because there's the news, there's the Facebook, there's everything where it's just, it's always right in front of us. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting of how the world responds to different life-changing events or world-changing events. When there's a moral war going on, just almost like World War II, the world comes together out of a heart of duty. I have to go, right? Mm. In natural disasters, people bond together and lend a helping hand. But in viruses, the world separates and a little bit sh shuts down a bit. Mm. It's a different type of response. I'm not claiming that this is a bad strategy to keeping the virus contained, but it does have an effect on our relationships. With the coronavirus going around, there are countries out there that are shutting down their doors for almost everything. Mm. Even churches are shutting down their doors and not allowing members to come in anymore. Wow. In Hong Kong, I think we are one of the only churches that is actually having church on Sundays. Wow. Yeah. In the whole city of Hong Kong. It's yeah. pretty crazy. And you think, okay, that's a good strategy. We don't want it to spread. That, that makes sense, but it affects our relationship. I know even this morning, uh, a couple of us here were just a bit earlier um, and just talking about what's going on and how in Australia there's been a shortage of toilet paper and people are freaking out. And they're literally fighting in Woolworths and Coles and whatever it is, the equivalent out there, and they're just fighting for toilet paper. Yeah. And that kind of shocked me because I thought we'd be fighting for like water or you know other resources and stuff, but I don't know what's going on in Australia. But they're fighting for toilet paper. Right there. But see, it 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 it, it has this thing where people are now turning on each other. Mm, it's wow. it's just it's just about yourself now, and it causes the world to uh, to excuse me to shake in fear. And we're gonna look at another thing though in the Bible here that. There's another spiritual virus going on, and that Paul was afraid of, as well as the church being afraid of as well. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. Then after 14 years, this is Paul writing, I went up to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took uh, Ty Titus along also. I went in response to the revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was running and had not been running my race in vain. Yo, know, the world today can be shocked to the core about the virus going around. What scared Paul here in these scriptures was that in his core, he's like, I'm scared that I'm preaching the wrong gospel. Wow. I'm scared I'm not preaching the truth. And we read here about the virus of false doctrine. And actually, how we look around today, how it has affected more hearts and damned more souls than any war, disaster, or virus we've ever faced. The virus of false doctrine. Come on, Sean. And Paul, throughout this chapter, is going to be talking about his personal fight for the truth and how we can learn from his example as well. My title for my lesson this morning is Truth's Only Hope. Point number one, stewards of the truth. 
Come on, Sean. See, Paul, just writing in the very beginning of this chapter, talks about his only real care was that he was on their stairway to heaven and helping people get on that rather than the highway to hell. Mm -hmm. And his pride and reputation as being another leader took back seat to him just with his walk with God and him preaching the truth. That I don't care if I'm saying what's wrong. I just want to know. Please just tell me the truth. See, when you preach a different gospel than the one true gospel, you are running your race in vain. Oh, yeah. That's what Paul started understanding. He was like, that's all I care about. Right. Mm -hmm. What kind of shocked me here, though, it says after 14 years, Paul was still concerned that he was teaching the truth. Wow. Even though he's been a teacher, he was not above being infected by false doctrine. Yeah. Now, I hoped in this response when he got with the esteemed leaders that he wasn't getting any groundbreaking new teachings or uh, any new revelations or else the last 14 years you know, would have been running in vain, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so we, we pray that he was running the right way. It's kind of like if you're running a marathon and on the 14th mile, you try to find out if you're running the right direction. Oh, God. Okay, that, that would be super discouraging. So hopefully Paul didn't have one of those. But also what is important is that it's awesome that he still knew that even him, he had to make sure he was still coming back to the truth. Yeah. Some people will say to older Christians or that have been a Christian for a long time, wow, you've been a Christian for 10 years, 15 years? Man, that, it must be easy for you now. That's awesome. That's just easy. That's kind of like talking to someone who's running a marathon. Wow, you're on the 15th mile now? Oh, you already did 14 others? That's easy. You know how to do it now. Yeah. No, it gets harder. Yeah. 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 Right? Even I really want to lift up uh, Ian and Margo for being such a great example. Uh, uh, I think you guys are, what, 25 years? As, as a Christian, older than some of you guys right there. But, um, you know, what they'll tell you in their experience, though, it, 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 yes, you can get, you can kind of know the truth, you can kind of get places, but it gets harder to keep running. Yeah. That extra little endurance, you've got to push yourself. And so I really want to lift you guys up. Amen. And Paul had this on his heart as well. He's like, even though I've been teaching for 14 years, I've got to make sure I just go back to the truth. Yeah. We notice that, the Paul, uh, that Paul went to them. He wasn't waiting for them to come to him. He took the initiative, being completely humble in the fear of truth. Meaning, I, I don't care what they say. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm doing what's right. See, a lot of people, especially when it comes to spirituality or religion, they, they don't like getting in conflict with it. They don't like getting down into a discussion of what is true and what is not. One thing that you can do, though, you can run away from disagreements. That's okay. There's going to be disagreements when we get into the conversation of belief, and how we are to follow that belief. But the one thing I believe Paul had on his heart is you cannot outrun the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't like whenever people say to me, that's your perspective. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. That's your belief. That's not what I'm trying to talk about. I don't care what my perspective is. I don't care what my belief is. I want to know the truth. Yeah. If you think I'm not following the truth, tell me. Mm. Don't just allow me to have my perspective. Yeah. That doesn't help me. And nor is that going to help you. Yeah. And so that's what Paul was here. He's like, I'm getting with these people, not just to present my, like, like as a presentation and say, hey, this is what I believe, this is cool. And he's like, I want you to tell me what I am doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And so he continues writing in uh, verse 3 through 5. Coming up to this church, he says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. you know, just to give a background, we talked about this in chapter 1, but what was going on in the churches of, uh, in Galatia at this moment was that inside the church, there started to be people that were converted from Judaism. And they were from Jews, and they were getting Christians, but what they would say is, hey, for people that are not Jewish, they need to first become a Jew, and then they can become a Christian. Mm -hmm. So they would teach them the Torah. The Torah is just a fancy word of the law, or the five first books of the Bible. And so you had to follow those things. You had to follow the law of Moses, 
and then you can become a Christian. So that's what he's talking about in the beginning there when he says, Titus came with me. He wasn't even compelled to be circumcised. During that time to be a Jew, you had to be circumcised. So the church was forcing that onto people right there. And it says here that Paul and Titus saw through their schemes. He knew what they were doing. It says that people were coming into the church and they wanted to take their freedom away. And I think there are two different ways that people can do this. Either they'll try and add to the Word of God more things that you need to do, more list and legalism, or they'll try and take away from it and say, no, you don't need to do that anymore. And they'll still change what you view as freedom. See, in this case, again, the non-believers were being made to first become Jewish until they can become Christian, uh, Christians. So when Paul mentions freedom, he doesn't mean just a general word of freedom. He means freedom from the Old Covenant law. Mm. So even churches today, um, if, if they're still requiring you to tithe, give 10%, that's an Old Covenant law. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're not required to tithe anymore. Yeah. You are called now to be generous and give up everything, so amen. But uh, <laughs> no, no longer the 10%, at least. Um, and there's a lot of other things that even churches today may not fully understand that that's Old Covenant. We're not doing that anymore. Mm. And so that's what he was understanding is that you're freed from the Old Covenant law. But don't be mistaken, though. This does not mean that you are free from God's commands. Right. That's not what he's talking about. See, Paul understood freedom like no other. His freedom came in the form of his slavery. Wow. Read this scripture with me. Romans 6, 17 through 18. Come on, Sean. It says, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teachings that now have claimed your allegiance. You have now been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. See, people sometimes, they will get you to question your freedom when you are holding on to your righteousness. And the main thing is because they're scared that you are no longer, uh, excuse me, they're scared that you are now out of your chains of sin. See, actually in this case, um, excuse me, you know, uh, uh, sorry, just going back, you know, the, the religious world is scared whenever to call people to live a righteous lifestyle. Yeah. See, this here, Paul understood that, hey, I'm no longer a slave to sin, but that doesn't mean I don't, I don't follow the commands of God. Yeah. I'm a slave to it. I want to do it. I, it it's, right. it's the desire of my heart. See, there's so many churches out there that are okay to call you out of your sin. They'll do that. The comfortability. They'll, they'll call you out, hey, stop smoking, stop drinking, stop sleeping around, whatever, they, whatever the sins that they perceive. But in any regard, there's still a fear to call people to live for righteousness. Okay, yeah, stop doing those things. Okay, how, how about sharing your faith? How about giving up everything? How about putting God above your family? See, that's what wasn't, Paul wasn't scared to call people to the conviction of the Bible. Come on, Sean. Actually, as we look in Paul's character, he says and claims about himself that he's worked harder than any of the other apostles. Not because he had to, but because his guilt was received with gratitude that he felt guilty about his sins, and he's like, I'm going to be so grateful that I just want to change. Wow. He was compelled by love. And we read here in John 5, 3 through 4, what it talks about. What does it mean to love God? In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. See, the Bible talks about that freedom is not just you can do what you want, but understanding the freedom that Christ has given you to actually live a righteous lifestyle. Some people will talk about us in our church, about how we obey God's word, and that we teach others to follow suit as well, as though we're burdening them. They'll say, why do you guys hold us such a high standard? Why do you call people so high? Why does God always have to be number one? Why do you have to give up everything? As though, first of all, like we made the standard. And second of all, as though it's a burden. Yeah. The Bible here talks about that God's commands are not burdensome. Mm -hmm. They actually don't understand the blessings 
of following God's word and having a conviction about it. Come on, Sean. See, for my life, I look at God's commands as my rehab. Mm. You think of, you think sharing my faith or writing a sermon is solely for your benefit? This helps me. God's commands help me. I owe my life to those that I'm able to help. You, you allow me to help you and show you the Bible? That, that sharpens me. That helps me to understand what I believe. Come on, Sean. The call to purity in my life was not just a challenge. It gave me the opportunity to find an amazing wife. Oh, gee. Mm. The call to invest in others helped me learn how to value others above myself. God's commands are not burdensome. They're my relief from the world. Mm. And that's what the religious world don't get. Whenever you just hold people to the standard of the Bible, you're, if you're not doing that, you're missing. You're actually burdening yourself. That you're going to try and follow Jesus without doing any of his advice. It's extremely difficult. See, when people talk about these commands, they, they, they say it's, it's burdensome. See, I am free from this world and all its purposes that it tries to have on me. And, the, and it scares the religious. They want, me to make, they want me to believe that I'm too strict when I'm freely following my Lord and Savior without any regrets. That's what the world wants you to feel like. They want to take away your freedom in Christ and just say, no, you don't understand, you're, you're burdened. No, 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 you're burdened. When I became a Christian, I threw away all my crutches. I, I, don't, I don't need a woman to tell me my value. Come on. I don't need to, to look at my appearance as that's where I get my value or how smart I am or anything, the other things that I used to value myself on. That's your burden. That's your crutches, world. Mm -hmm. I, I don't need that anymore. When I became a, a, a Christian, I threw away my burdens. Mm -hmm. And they think that only Christians are the ones that have burdens. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not that way. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what Paul was telling him here, is I am free and I love it. Mm -hmm. He was a stewardess of the truth. He was proud to be this. And he says here that they didn't give in because they were proud of it. To live in freedom of Christ and to spend that freedom on Christ. See, here Paul understood that he represented something far bigger than just himself. And that's something that we have to understand as Christians as well. Is that you represent a lineage of a Lord and Savior. You think it's nothing when you don't hold on to your convictions? When it means everything. Yeah. You know, actually today is uh, the International Women's Day. Uh, so you women, <laughs> uh, if you didn't know, Women's Day, you're supposed to be wearing purple. Uh, so I don't know how many people didn't know that, but that's okay. But, and green, and green, so whoever had green, there it is. Come on, Jess. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, if you have a little earring or something green, you can, your green eyes, I don't know. Let's go, to you. But um, today, the, what is it called, not the motto, the, the theme for this year, for 2020, International Women's Day, is uh, you don't do the haka, but uh, you go like this, which means each for equal. And so it's the quality of women all around the world. But it had this meaning, and a deeper meaning, talking about that as individuals, we need to come together as collectively, mm -hmm. like a collection. And so each of us are going for equality. And it was a really cool meaning, and I thought that was the same thing that it talks about here in the Bible as well, is yes, you are your own individual. Yes, it is your walk with God. But you have to realize that you represent something so much bigger than yourself for you. And I really want to put that on your, your hearts this morning. And my first challenge to you guys is die to yourself. Yeah. And let Christ live in you. It has nothing to do with you. This conviction and fighting for the truth is so much bigger than just yourself. Yeah. Stop letting emotions run your life. Come on, Sean. See, I have a new saying here is don't follow your heart, follow your hero. Woo. Look at Jesus, see what he's doing, and follow that in truth. Yeah. Point number two is protectors of the truth. As we continue reading verse 6 through 10, it says, As for those who, we, uh, who were held in high esteem, whatever... They, excuse me, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show any favoritism. They added nothing to my message. 
On the contrary, they recognize that I have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised. That's pretty much those who are not Jewish. Just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, who esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they be circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I have been eager to do all along. So Paul just pretty much continue writing and saying how, just like how Peter was recognized as an apostle to all the Jews, Paul in himself was recognized as an apostle, just kind of meaning one of the twelve that was with Jesus, the apostle, to the non-believers. He was the main guy to go out there and do there, uh, uh, to go out there and have that purpose with the Gentiles. And it puts on our hearts a little bit of a kind of like a side sermon there, that there is the same gospel, but there can be different callings. Right? There's, there's enough work to be done for everyone to have your own in individual calling. Your, your own calling for you to go and do something great for God. See, unity doesn't mean uniformity. I think sometimes can, people can get on the one path when they start dreaming for God is, oh, i got to be an evangelist, or i got to be a church leader, i got to do this. No, there's, there's a lot of other work you can do here in the world. Yeah. And just because we're unified as a movement doesn't mean we have to all do the exact same thing. Right. Yeah. Find your calling and go after it. Yeah. And see, he talks about once you find it, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. He's like, I don't care. These guys are high esteemed. I, I don't care, actually, because God shows no favor to them. I just want to do my calling. And in John 10, verse 4, it talks about really listening and paying attention to God's calling rather than what the world wants to call you to do. John 10, 4 says, when he, was, when he has brought out all of his own, he gone on ahead of them. This is talking about God and his people. And his sheep followed him because they knew his voice. Sometimes when people are listening to a calling, they're listening to all the wrong voices. Right. Mm. They're listening to the world, your family, friends, peers, even your own heart. And you keep asking, what, what, what is my calling? I know when we first got here, Tegan and myself, and uh, we lived out in Ellerslie. And it, oh, I think it was God. maybe the first or second week that we were here in the city. And we didn't know where, I kept calling it Bruno Mart. But uh, we're not, I, I, we didn't know where it was. So we were asking everybody. But pretty much every single person we talked to were foreigners. Mm. And uh, so we're talking to this person. He was giving us advice. And some guy randomly came up and he was like, they don't know what they're talking about. No, it's this way. And uh, he ends up taking us. Do you guys know where the, the um, uh, Spark Arena is? But right next to it, there is this apartment with like the, the train station. It used to be an old train station. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, he takes us there. And, uh, yeah, we're just standing out in front of it. I'm like, this is not it. This is no way in. And to be honest, that was probably the worst day of last year. Uh, we were walking around for like a good two hours until we found this, this place. Um, so it, it taught me in a small little sense, it matters who you're getting direction from. Yeah. And see here, God is saying, pay attention to my voice. Right. Know my calling. Doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. Find your calling from God and follow that. Mm. See, the only thing it continues on, it says, the only thing they were concerned about is that they had a heart for the poor. And again, this puts on our heart, not only are we fighting for the truth, but we always have to be fighting for compassion in our heart for the poor as well. Yeah. That we cannot forget how it is, how important it is to care for the poor. Because when we start to close our heart to the needy, we choose not, pretty much in one sense or another, we choose not to see the pain of others. We're saying, I'm going to turn a blind eye to them. Mm. And we start to make excuses for ourselves to make us feel better. Well, they would use my money on booze anyway. Well, maybe they're in that situation because they got themselves there. And we're, we're turning our hearts away from them. So again, another small little challenge we have is we got to remember that we're, we're, we're thinking about the poor and the needy in our community. My one challenge for this week, for you guys here, at least a sub-challenge, is I want you to go speak to someone in need. Just go out, someone this week, and if they're just sitting there on the side of the road, whatever it may be, just talk to them. 
most of these people just need a friend. Yeah. Most of them just need someone to say, hey, I care for you and I'm thinking about you. Because most people just walk beside and try not to look because they're thinking that they're going to beg for money or something. So that's my one sub-challenge is just go and talk to one person this week that is in need. So he continues on, verse 11, and talks about how now he's going to be the protector of the truth here. Verse 11, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Okay, what's going on here? That, that, that changed quickly. Uh, because he stood condemned. For before, uh, for before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they ar arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas, one of Paul's partners right there. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then? that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. For those that don't know, Cephas is, is just Peter, the guy who was previously talking to, the apostle to the, Gent uh, to, to, the, uh, um, to the circumcised, to the Jewish nation. And when he first came, he was comfortable with dining with those that did not have a Jewish background. But things changed when his other friends started to come along. Mm. That he was sitting with the Gentiles before, but these other Jews started to come from the circumcision group, the people that are forcing them to abide by the Old Testament. And he's like, hey, why, Peter, why are you sitting over there? Why, Peter, come, come over here, man. You're with us. And he started to get an influence, and he started to separate himself from the Gentiles again. And it says here, Paul's conviction that he went up to the leader of the church during that moment, and it says he had posed him to his face in front of everyone. Mm. That would have been a sight to see. Peter has been gone, gone through a lot. Previously, he was called like pretty much Satan, get behind me by Jesus. And now in front of everyone by Paul, Peter, what are you doing right here? You would have, I wonder what that conversation would have went like right there. But Peter, Peter, what are you doing there? Peter, these are the sheep that Jesus begged you to care for. Remember when Jesus was asking you, Peter, if you loved him? And that the only response he's, when you said yes is care for my sheep? These are them, Peter. What are you doing? He would have that on his heart to fight for the truth. See, even when it comes to the leader, even more when it comes to the leader, because when they are in sin, everyone else changes around them. Although it's not wanted and done. That's true. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it changes what happens around them. See, you think that some people will come in with a heart of sentimentality to a church and say, well, you know, every church has its, has its issues. Well, every church is kind of sorting out its doctrine. Every church is, you know, missing a little bit of fundamentals. But you don't understand actually what's at stake. Mm -hmm. See, Paul didn't say, well, it's okay. The, the Jews here, the Gentiles there, we'll, we'll, we'll coexist with each other. That's okay. No, he got down and opposed him to his faith and fought for the truth. Right. See, if you're not opposing anything, the things that are wrong in this world, what do you stand for? If you're not like, this is true, and I'm going to stand up for it regardless of who it is, then what do you actually believe? See, we have to have on our hearts not to be sentimental when it comes to the truth. Either it's a truth or it is not. And we have to stand up and fight for that. My challenge for you guys is not only to live by the truth, but to stand up for the truth. Mm -hmm. on. To go that extra bit. To go that extra mile. And not just to make sentimentality, well, hey, you have to understand they're working. No, we stand up for the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, in conclusion, point number three, because we are the lovers of the truth. Aww. Galatians 2, 15 through 16. We who are Jews by birth and not simple Gentiles, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. 
this is a scripture, again, you have to put in context throughout the book of, of uh, Galatians. Yeah. This is one of the, the climax of the word works, right? It says plainly here that it talks about the works of the law. It says it twice throughout these scriptures. About it means, again, abiding in the law of Moses. And some will say, okay, well, this is also a scripture that will plainly show you that you are justified by our faith in Christ Jesus. Yes, that's true. But just how like we needed to define works, we also need to define faith. You can't just say, well, I believe that's it. I mean, we've got to define what does faith mean. Faith is not just a belief in accepting something in your heart. Faith has always been linked to actions in obedience to God's word. You know, the Bible is kind of funny for those that don't have any intention to really understand it. Because it will say things like, the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. All sin comes from the heart. Yet, God says, hey, I want you to love me with all of it. <laughs> okay, this is kind of confusing. It also says that we're justified by faith, but we must repent to be saved. Okay, how, how, do, we, how do we actually understand those two together? Yeah, point on. Well, some would use this as ammunition to excuse themselves and saying, well, hey, whatever, I, I don't need to give my whole heart. I just need to believe. But the thing is, is that, you know, how far back are we going to go with this understanding? Some people will say, well, hey, I only need faith because if I have to repent, that means I'm earning my salvation. But you don't understand the mindset that you're using in, in your, your rationale with that. You're saying just because it was your decision to, re to repent or your actions, it leads to you earning something. It, it doesn't really work that way. Mm -hmm. How far back are we going to use that terminology or that rationale? Okay, it's because you chose to believe, now you're saved. So you earned it still, because you did. It's because you decided to pray. It's because you decided to accept Jesus in your heart when others wouldn't. How far back are we going to say what's you and what's God? Right. Come on, Sean. Come on, Sean. You've you got to separate. It's either, it's either God or it's you. Yeah. See, the Bible even talks about repentance is a gift from God. Yeah. Mm. Instead of looking at it that way, because it doesn't actually line up in all the ways that we do it, right? Either you're earning it or you're not. And the thing is, instead we should look at it like this. If you win the lottery, but you have to walk to the store to claim your prize, did you earn it? No. You didn't earn it, you're just claiming it. Mm. That's all you're doing. In the same way, in everything in our life, we actually have to look through the gospel. Did I earn my wife? Did I earn to be alive today? No, we are always undeserving. Yeah. And that's, that's the gospel. In all things we're undeserving. Not just in faith or when it comes to repentance. But with that, our response should not just be, okay, I'm just going to pray and I'll be it. I'll let God do his thing. No, we have to respond, I'm undeserving, so therefore I need to be grateful and give my heart. Come on, come on. It's not that I'm deserving, so I don't want to do it. Well, that's, that's just being selfish. That's looking how you feel. Right. Yeah. Come on. Think about the sacrifice that Jesus had to make to give you this yeah. gift. Mm. Right? That's like me treating my wife, hey, I don't deserve you, so I, I can't be with you anymore. <laughs> that, that wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. I don't deserve her, so therefore I should, I, should, I, should, I should honor her. I should respect her. It's the same way with our relationship with God. We don't deserve it, therefore we should give it more honor. Come on. See, so he talks about in... In 17 through 21, coming up to a conclusion, I won't read it, but he talks about and how he's going to continue to live his life, no longer how he used to live it, but live it in Christ uh, now that he has been given the freedom in Christ. See, living by faith, faith, that word, in the Christian community has always been a verb. It's always been an action. Righteousness is not gained by repentance. Because obviously we're always proven lacking, right? We can't, we can never, uh, we can't uh, never erase our sins that we've done in the past. But it's only through Jesus can we live by faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, our call here, guys, is not only just to say, wow, there's the truth. But it's looking at the truth and never looking back. Mm -hmm. Being excited and living for it. Yes, we don't deserve the truth. Yes, it's going to be hard sometimes. But aren't you just so excited to live by it? Because mm -hmm. once you start doing it, 
you will start to have that same feeling, is the truth is my rehab. Mm -hmm. It helps me live the best life that I can ever live. See, my title for this morning was Truth's Only Hope. And I want to put on your heart that you are truth's only hope. That it is up to you. That there are going to be so many, so many things in the world, there's going to be so many different teachings, doctrines, religions, beliefs, zodiac signs, meditation circles, philosopher's stones, I don't, I don't know. There's going to be a lot of things out there. But there's only one truth. Yeah. Come on, Sean. And you need to be its proud steward and guard to fight for the truth and stand up for it. Thank you very much.